Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, to this uh, session on the latest decisions on fair use um, that we're presenting here at the UCLA Library as part of 2023's Fair Use Week. Uh, my name is Marty Brennan, and let me go ahead. I'm the uh, Scholarly Communication Education Librarian here at the UCLA Library. Um, it's a pleasure to have everybody here today. Um, can everybody see um, the uh, screen slide that says latest decisions on fair use? Um, good, that's good. Um, I say welcome to everybody that's uh, in the room. I don't see a slide. I just see your handsome face. Oh, okay. Then let me see if I can escape out of this. Um, hmm. Are you guys getting snow? Uh, I'm in upstate New York. Yes, we're getting snow up here. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> um, so, okay, you, probably, you can all still see my face. Let me try to share the screen again. Um, can you now see? Yeah, now we're seeing the slides. Okay, great. So uh, welcome to the session. And uh, let me say today, uh, again, we're going to talk about latest decisions on fair use, in particular, the Google versus Oracle decision from a few years back, and the Prince and Andy Warhol um, uh, decision that's now being considered by the Supremes. Um, uh, let me, let's see. Now, can you all see that on your full screen? Yes, okay. So first of all, I'm not an attorney and I'm not offering legal advice. The following information is presented to educate about copyright law and institutional policy in general terms. If you're unclear about your options when confronted with the specific legal issue related to copyright, you are urged to consult with an attorney with a background in copyright law. So today's objective is to review the rights of copyright owners, talk about the evolution of fair use and the four factor test that's used to determine fair use, uh, a little bit about university policy around that and codes of best practices, and then talk about actual fair use cases for discussion. I'm gonna move through things pretty quickly be uh, free to uh, post a question into chat <clears throat> um, if you have any questions. Um, but uh, to start off, um, the exclusive right of copyright owners as laid out in section 106 of the copyright law says, uh, copyright owners have the exclusive right to reproduce or to make copies of works to create adaptations or derivative works, to distribute copies to the public, to perform the work publicly, and to display the work publicly. Now, the owner of a copyright may license or grant each of these rights to others, uh, but these are the general rules or the general ways in which copyright can be applied to copyrighted works. And so there is exceptions to the copyright law, and one of the most often used uh, is fair use. Fair use is an affirmative defense which allows the use of a work protected by copyright without obtaining permission from the copyright owner. So how this works, it's an equitable rule of reason. It's a judge-made test that's derived and grown through common law rulings over the years. It's endorsed by the 1976 Copyright Act in Section 107, though not strictly limited by the factors enumerated in the law. And in fact, it has evolved a bit since the uh, 76 ruling um, and continues to evolve uh, in judicial rulings to this day. Uh, some early cases, it goes back to 1841, Justice Story defined a nice balance to be struck. Um, and whether the subsequent use of original is justified is tested by a balance on the same factors we use today. Um, the term fair use was first used in Lawrence v. Dana in 1869, and there are many cases throughout the following hundred years that uh, shape how we come to understand and use fair use. 
But in a 68 decision that spurred some legislative action, um, a federal court found that drawings based on frames from the Zapruder film of JFK's assassination that were published in a book were um, included under fair use. Uh, it did not enumerate the four factors in the decision and considered other relevant context. So this was a bit of a um, out of context decision that uh, I had a big part in the legislative effort over the following eight years to get to the 1976 Copyright Act. Uh, when they put these four factors of fair use into the law, they were endorsing the purpose and general scopus, uh, scope of the judicial doctrine of fair use, but they weren't freezing it. So courts must be free to adapt the doctrine to particular situations on a case-by-case -case basis. And then uh, they said clearly, too, that Section 107 is intended to restate the present judicial doctrine, not to change, narrow, or enlarge it in any way. Uh, so it's really future decisional um, rulings that have come out since that have had some additional shaping of how fair use looks and is applied. And <laughs> as a result, full employment for uh, lawyers. Uh, fair use is more flexible than any other copyright exception. Um, it can provide an exception to any and all of the bundle of rights as we call those um, uh, those five different rights, uh, as described at the start, um, and it adapts to new uses and new technologies all the time. Um, fair use is impossible to define apart from the specific circumstances of a case. It's a balancing test that's used within judicial discretion. Um, and there is debate of whether it's an affirmative defense, which I called it at the start of the session, or is it the boundary of a right? Uh, in any case, there's always an assessment of risk uh, when you're looking at something and trying to decide whether fair use applies to it. So um, there's always going to be some ambiguity uh, when you are making a fair use decision. And so it can be really uh, a tough thing to do in certain situations. And uh, you may find your decisions challenged. Um, so let's talk about the four factors of fair use. Uh, there's the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the use, and the impact on the market. Those are the four factors that a judge must go through when determining whether something was um, properly uh, shared through the fair use exception. So in terms of purpose and character of the use, if something is educational in nature, um, then that's going to be viewed as a fair use, as opposed to something that's entertainment or commerce would be more likely to be determined not for fair use. Something that's not for profit is fair use. Something that's for profit is not fair use. And pretty decisively, transformative versus iterative. So things that are um, pr uh, produced for a different audience and um, uh, uh, for uh, a different purpose than the original. Um, that's really taking something and transforming it into uh, use in a different context and scope. Um, that kind of use is heavily favored. So parodies and collages of things, uh, in particular, the Campbell v. A. Cuff Rose case um, was a transformative use that was um, a, a parody. Um, and educational reaches... Educational and research uses are often iterative and can still be fair use. Um, so um, even though iterative uses in general are more likely not going to be fair use, in educational and research uh, contexts, uh, we find that it can be. So the purpose and character of the use is pretty important. That's one factor. A second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. Is it published? If it's published, it's more available and more um, um, uh, usable under the fair use uh, statute than if it's unpublished. Uh, if it's something that's factual, uh, just facts and figures, then it's more available to be reused. But something that's highly creative is less available to be um, uh, available through uh, fair use. So that's number two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Third factor is the amount and substantiality of the use. 
less is always better in a fair use analysis. Um, and uh, so, you know, there are lots of debates about the amounts of use that can be used of a particular work before you get into uh, something that's not fair use. Um, there's lots of debate. There's, a, you know, a, a 10 to 20 percent threshold on a lot of printed works. But of course, when you're reusing an image, you have to use 100 percent of it. Um, so the amount of work is really uh, depends on the kind of work that you're handling uh, in its analysis. Um, and it's better if you don't use the heart of the work. Uh, but this is a, an unresolved conflict for me. Don't the best academic expert excerpts pinpoint the heart of the work um, to include as part of critical analysis. So uh, it, that can be very tricky. That hasn't come into a lot of judicial rulings around fair use, though, to be honest. Number four, impact on the market. Um, and this can be very mechanical. How many copies are made? How widely are they distributed? Is the use spontaneous or repeated? Is the original available for sale or license? Um, and a transformative use changes this market analysis to a degree in that parity can't be seen to harm the market for the original. Um, so, uh, Basically, when you look at how these four factors really work, what is meant is that uh, the judge must look at each of the four factors individually. Then there's also the, the fifth factor of looking at all four factors put together uh, on the whole. And um, then how it really works is that um, fair use has become a fairly mechanical test. And in practice, the first factor, the purpose and character of the use, and the fourth factor, the market effect, are usually given the most weight in judicial opinions, um, even though the Supreme Court has clearly stated that the four factors may not be treated in isolation. What I'm saying here is in this um, um, uh, study that was done of fair use decisions, they looked at how the first factors, or, or all four factors were looked at and discussed. And if the first factor and the fourth factor uh, seem to point towards fair use, then um, the results will be fair use. So it comes down to what is the purpose of the use and what is uh, the effect on the market for the most part. Of course, it's very important and it's been reiterated by the Supremes, but you must look at all four factors, but this is something that's really dispositive in a um, uh, an analysis of fair use decisions. So one of the things that's come up um, over the last 20 years is uh, the Center for Media and Social Impact has put out these codes of best practices for fair use in X. Um, there's one for academic libraries. There's one for um, documentaries. Uh, there's uh, at least a dozen, if not more, of these um, codes of best practices now. Um, so one of the things that it comes out of these codes, a very bit of interesting writing that says from the code, four factors are boiled down to, did the use transform the material taken from the copyrighted work by using it for a broadly beneficial purpose different from that of the original, not repeating the work for the same intent and value as the original? And if you can say, yes, it was something that was transformed, then was the material taken appropriate in kind and amount, considering the nature of the copyrighted work and of the use? So it does make it a bit simpler that a, a great deal of the copyright or the, uh, the fair use decisions that we uh, base our decisions on um, from the last uh, 15, 20, 30 years um, boil down to this issue of transformative use. So um, you take it, you take a copyrighted work and you work it into something that has a broadly beneficial purpose different from that of the original. Um, and you take uh, uh, an amount that is appropriate uh, for the purposes that you have in mind. 
So I wanted to say that there's a UC policy on copyright and fair use. Uh, to f and the summary of the policy says, to fulfill its teaching, research, and public service mission, it is the policy of the University of California to encourage the broad dissemination and use of information in accordance with the copyright law. The university will defend its employees who use copyrighted materials in an informed, reasonable, and good faith manner and within the scope of their university employment. So generally when um, you know university uh, educators, whether they are uh, working within their courses and sharing materials with their students, that they uh, try to employ fair use in uh, um, a reasonable way uh, and make reasonable decisions, then the university will stand uh, behind them uh, in a court of law. So I just thought that's important to bring up in a session like this. Um, so many important fair use cases are summarized here in this, um, hold on, let me get out of this and copy that website and I'm going to paste it into the chat for you all. I really recommend that you jump into this page to see the different kinds of fair use cases that have uh, risen to the top in terms of what people consider. Um, are we back at full screen again? Can everybody see that? Somebody let me know in chat if we are. Um, yes, okay. So when you go to this site at, uh, at Stanford um, uh, and look at the fair use cases, um, you can see the many different cases that have been um, included on different topics. Um, it, it can be pretty uh, interesting to go through them because there are some cases that are really directly uh, in contrast with each other or so it would seem. Uh, and it certainly is dispositive that if you are uh, using something from a different context, you know, when you're talking about things in um, the copying of computers and uh, sharing things on a, a system-wide basis to a great degree, fair use can be incredibly important. Uh, some of the decisions that have come down um, uh, involve Google and some of the biggest players in the internet world and uh, uh, going up against each other on different things. Um, can have huge impacts upon how the internet works in general um, and has been pretty freeing so far um, the way that fair use has been allowed. On the other hand, you can look at certain cases that are related to one image or one piece of music being reused and they can seem to be really restrictive and not allowing uh, nearly the same amount of freedom. So uh, fair use is uh, something that really does rely upon a judge and a judge's uh, take on things. Uh, there is a general uh, sense of things are determined by this um, transformative use paradigm that has come into a, a dominant frame. Um, but for the most part, it can be really fascinating to do a dive down into these cases and see what kinds of things are out there. Um, there's, you know, from the Betamax case in the early 80s, uh, you know, whether using um, videotape to record something was uh, a copyright violation, um, that was a pretty big determinative case. There's the Pretty Woman case that's in there. Uh, that's uh, the cover of Pretty Woman, or at least the the song of, of Pretty Woman you know, there's the Roy Orbison song that came out uh, in the 70s, or I guess maybe the 60s. And uh, then there was a version put out by Two Live Crew in the 80s that was a lot more crude and um, um, had elements of the first Pretty Woman, but it was very much a, a version of its own. Um, they asked for permission before they uh, put out the, the version, were denied permission. Um, by the Orbison uh, um, um, 
the owners of the Orb Orbison copyright denied in permit uh, denied permission to to Live Crew. They went ahead and released it anyway. Um, it, in that case, it was decided that it was a parody version of the original Pretty Woman, and it was um, had a huge impact it, on the whole idea of looking at something as a, a transformative use. And a lot of cases have pointed back to Pretty Woman since then. There's also um, the Let's Go Crazy case um, that was uh, actually uh, seen to be a fair use. And it pointed to people to be very careful before uh, implementing a DMCA takedown on anyth anything to consider whether fair use uh, was at play. To do so without, without you know, to put through a DMCA takedown request without deciding or uh, you know, giving uh, some consideration to the fact that fair use could be at, at play uh, is uh, bad acting uh, in and of itself. So um, there are many important cases like that that have led up to our, our full understanding today. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk about a couple in particular. Google versus Oracle. Um, had a decision come down through the Supreme Court after years working its way through the courts that centered on Google's use of the API um, and about 11,000 lines of source code that were owned by Oracle. <clears throat> or Oracle argued that the APIs were copyrightable. And in April 2021, uh, the Supreme Court ruled six to two that Google's use of the Java APIs fell within the four factors of fair use. And it also at the same time bypassed the question on the copy copyright ability of the APIs. Um, so it was a pretty impactful decision. Uh, it's amazing how many friend of the court um, uh, filings were included in these um, uh, in this case, all the way up to the Supremes, of whether um, APIs, in, in, in an essence, whether e APIs in general could be copyrightable and whether uh, the use of them could be viewed as uh, an infringement upon the original. So um, that was a, a, a huge, impactful case. And uh, um, another case that happened uh, is still in front of the Supreme Court today is the Andy Warhol F Foundation versus um, Goldsmith. So in this case, if you look at this um, image here on the screen, and I should probably go back to slide presentation. This middle image, the black and white image is the original, right? And uh, on the right, you have a, a sampling of the Andy Warhol, Warhol images that were uh, used, uh, I'm sorry, used that original black and white as its basis. Uh, there was a $400 fee paid to um, the photographer Goldsmith uh, to use those images in the Warhol uh, images on the right. Um, then in 2000, so this all happened in the... Um, in the 80s, uh, the use of these images. But then in 2016, Vanity Fair, in the cover on the left, um, paid $10,000 to Andy Warhol's foundation in order to use that image as the cover uh, of this issue. So uh, Goldsmith, the original photographer, sued, saying they never got her permission in order to use this image which was, you know, already a derivative of, of uh, her works. So um, that is a case that is, uh, has been argued. They had oral arguments in October. And of course, if you know how the Supreme Court works, uh, we'll see some kind of decision on this before the end of term uh, at the end of June of this year. Um, this is a pretty impactful case as well. Uh, in terms of you know something uh, on on the issue of fair use um, hasn't been um, 
looked at all too often at the Supreme Court level. And here's something that's about to come on to the Supreme Court and, and we'll get a decision on it. So it'll be interesting to see how this new court makeup looks at this and says, is it enough um, that the um, the uh, uh, Warhol people gave permission to use this or do you need to go all the way back to the original owner of the image to get permission um, to use those images as well? So, um again in 2016 vanity fair published one of warhol's images from this prince series the foundation charged condon asked a 10,000 licensing fee for to publish the image and the question is does that second use for which the magazine did not pay goldsmith infringes goldsmith's copyright in the photograph on which warhol based all his images this was again argued um uh, in October in front of the Supremes and a decision is coming this term. So anyway, um, uh, if you'll all forgive me, that's uh, the abrupt ending <laughs> to this, but I really did want to go back. Let me get out of this and go back to um, the fair use cases here let me get out of sharing screen okay finally stop sharing so um i did want to get to that fair use page if I could and re review some of the fairies decisions there that are particularly important and um, used on a regular basis. Um, just a second. So I will share again. To see, as I was saying, you know, there's cases involving text and there's lots of decisions on that because, you know, that's uh, copyright covers text a lot further back than some of the other things that were brought into copyright since. Um, and when you look at, particularly when you look at cases involving text, it can really get down to um, a, a fine tooth comb of uh, exactly how much was used. Sometimes more than 20% seems like beyond fair use. Sometimes it can be uh, quite a lot less than that. It, it comes down to proportions sometimes, and there can be a lot of variance in how it's approached when you're looking at amounts of text from a work. Then when you go to arts and visual arts and audiovisual uh, aspects of themes, things, it can um, be a lot more flexible there. Um, uh, you look for uh, specific numbers that you might be able to find in terms of the amounts of things. I can say that, you know, 100% of images can be used um, and uh, pieces of artwork, 100% of things can be used in some circumstances, and uh, it can be a fair use in order to effectively reference the original image. Um, you know, you can talk about, you can only use 10 to 20% of text, but there's no 10 to 20%, you know, applied to when you're talking about images or pieces of video. Um, some people would love uh, to see um, uh, a specific amount of time uh, or amount of or a percentage of a work that you can use, but there is a, uh, an intentional vagueness and variance built into the law uh, so that you know you can apply it across different kinds of, of types of things. Then when you get to internet cases, it gets, you know, even crazier in terms of what it is applied to. Um, you can talk about different uh, 
amounts of of text and images and other kinds of things that are included in in big uh, databases of materials and when fair use applies. Um, and they can be very important to consider. Uh, I, I would point to to this. Um, our, uh, let's see, are you all seeing on screen? Let me uh, share again, because I'm not sure it was showing correctly. Um, you should all be seeing, um, yeah, this bit that I'm showing on the screen here. Um, a copyright owner must consider the likelihood of a claim of fair use. In that case, um, the owner of the video claimed that since Universal didn't consider the issue of fair use, Universal could not have a good faith belief that they were entitled to the, this takedown. Um, uh, so there is um, a district court agreed that the failure to consider fair use when sending a DMCA notice could give rise to a claim of failing to act in good faith. So this lens issue is, is a big impact. Um, music cases can have a lot of, of interesting uh, impacts as well. Uh, parody cases are certainly some of the most uh, important, like the, the one from Two Life Crew here um, had a big defining aspect when it comes to transformative use. Um, and there's other image related things there as well, but I really think this can be, you know, you can go down a rabbit hole here, or at least I have, and really just go into these different cases and see the kinds of materials that are available in there, um, and how they impact our ability to do, um, these kinds of, of things. So, Anyway, I really wanted to uh, get across uh, those two really recent cases, uh, the the Prince case uh, and Andy Warhol, which is um, actually getting a lot of attention because it's at Supremes and because of the the big names involved, Andy Warhol versus Prince, it seems. But neither of them are alive to to argue about any of it. It's really just who's got the the money hooks into their estates. Um, so. And and Prince really isn't involved anyway. He's just the the subject of a photograph. So um, anyway, it's uh, it's interesting to see how the Supremes could rule on that. And certainly, the Google versus um, Oracle case is a big deal in terms of of how things are handled um, uh, in terms of. Uh, APIs and the interconnectivity among uh, uh, interfaces uh, that is really hugely dependent upon the ability to uh, to borrow code from one place into another. So the ability to employ fair use in that realm has been vital. And if if it had not gone that way, uh, I think you could have seen a huge disruption in how the internet works. So um, those two cases in particular are having a, a big impact. Um, but it, I will say, you know, there hasn't been any cases of giant upheaval uh, in terms of fair use in the last five, 10 years that um, I have seen. Uh, for the most part, uh, fair use continues to be a very useful and very flexible uh, exception to copyright law that's employed in all kinds of ways. Um, I'm debating with people this week, uh, you know, a certain amount of how fair use applies to a couple of decisions. <laughs> and people sometimes go ahead with uh, something that's squiffy and not really clear and uh, may be challenged, uh, and then nothing ever happens. So um, it, it's it's constantly something that people have the ability to make their own decisions on and, and uh, be assertive about. And as long as you make... Uh, uh, informed decisions uh, based on, you know, your understanding of, of copyright and fair use, uh, then the university will uh, back you up as a university employee if you're acting um, within the scope of your employment. So uh, I'm always available uh, to help people uh, with any kinds of fair use decisions. I can explain the law and uh, exceptions. I can do some research and see you know, if I can find other cases that are relevant to what you're doing, 
but in the end it's always up to uh to university folks to make their own decisions on fair use and um you know when things come down to the line um the university will stand behind you uh as long as you're acting in good faith so um that's all i want to say for now i i would guess does anybody have any questions about the content or some of the cases that i've discussed up to this point and laura is correct we are lucky to have general counsel say that they will step forth and defend you. Do I have a bet in about how the Prince case will come out? Um, uh, not, not really. I it's it's uh, a matter of there are too many new voices on the court. Um, the only thing I would say it, it it's it was surprising that it was six two in um, Google Oracle. Uh, the court balance hasn't changed that much since then. Um, but uh, with the new voices on the court, I really don't have, um, I don't think that the, the newly conservative court has any particular reason to disrupt fair use um, in such a significant way. Um, but we will see. Uh, what about you, Laura? Laura's, like, my God, is, <sighs> A, a great expert on on this. So, Laura, do you want to unmute and say what you think is going to happen? Um, actually, I'm kind of with you um, <laughs> on this. That it's a little hard to predict. It's uh, I don't want to see it disrupted significantly, but I kind of, you know, I kind of wonder why they took it. You know what I mean? Like, are they looking for a vehicle to? shape the law in different directions that's my main kind of think thinking like hmm you know what's the thinking here why would they take it yeah so we'll that see what what comes of it um mm -hmm. you know as usual these things come out very late so um we'll see but they did argue it early in the term it could come out any minute but it's most likely to come out towards the end of term and when it does come out, those of us like Murdy and I will be like busily reading and writing <laughs> exactly. and trying to assess it. <laughs> like what? It's out? And then, you know, drop everything and turn and read. Yeah, there goes the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, who knows? You could see a, a big change in direction with that ruling, right? Uh, in terms of, of how uh, the Supremes approach fair use. Who knows? Um. Will I do the game show next year? Uh, I haven't been talking to anybody else involved in the game show. If 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 y'all don't know what she's talking about, um, who is that anyway? C N C R Thaxon. Uh, 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 Scott Dix. Okay, hi Scott. Um, so I haven't talked to any of the other people involved in it um, since we last did it, which is before the uh, pandemic. So um, my God, I don't know. I think somebody approached me to possibly do it at uh, Baltimore, but I wasn't gonna be at Baltimore, so I had to pass. So perhaps um, Kyle at Harvard, uh, Kyle Courtney, is still going ahead and doing game show stuff um, at the uh, ALA and ACRL uh, meetings. He loves a chance to wear his shiny jacket, so. <laughs> yes. Yes, I stepped back from being the the, the leader in, in this game show that we do about fair use um, to let Kyle do it because he's such a, a natural. And instead I was the person, like the MC for the session, you know, and that was a lot of fun. Um, so, um, uh, perhaps I can share video of those things too. So any other questions from anybody? Another question on the Prince case. Do you think, um, there would have been a difference had the Warhol foundation not charged money for the image? For the <laughs> I don't know. And it, it comes down to what motivates the copyright owner to push so hard, go so hard on these things. I think, you know, that it's just uh, uh, the fact that it was the cover, you know, 
uh, I think was pretty an egregious use of the image without getting the permission. And for them to get $10,000 based on a $400 permission that they paid years prior, you know, it, it's a matter of an ego said, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to stand for this and, and decided to push it in court. Um, who knows, though, I, you know, there could be other things uh, behind the scenes that have even greater impact on why this was pushed as hard as it was. Um, but uh, there you have it. I mean, I, I don't know. Did I uh, an answer your question? No, I'm, I, I went off on a, a little tangent, so I'm not sure. No, that was fine. Okay. Any Just other curious. questions? It's all about money when it comes down to it. And uh, yes. with Prince's death, I'm sure there's money to be made. <laughs> and lots of crazy people around Prince, you know, to keep the crazy going. Let's let's go crazy. Go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes, Barbara. Prince was so very protective of his rights, but ironically died without a will. So. Yes. What's ironic. <laughs> Just a comment from Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. It's true. Very strange. No will from Prince. Okay, well, um, given no extra questions, I want to thank everybody for showing. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. Uh, and um, thank you all.